Yes, uh, good day for all of you because I know like, you know, everybody is joining from different time zones. So I'm just going to share a small, uh, you know, uh, two minute presentation about Coco Town because a lot of uh, new people I'm seeing, they are not our customers. So I, you know, give me a few minutes to just share a screen and then we can go to Claudia's uh, webinar that you're all looking for. And we thank Claudia for presenting this webinar like in about the complex chocolates. Okay, yeah, Coco Town is in the business of not just selling the machines. We are in the business of creating and empowering chocolatepreneurs around the world. And our mission is pioneering craft chocolate technology because we were the first one to recognize the need for creating small scale machines for the chocolate industry. And now everybody is uh, following it up. So that's a good news. And our vision to be the one-stop shop for the chocolate produce and food produce to create award-winning chocolates and gourmet foods because all of our machines are multi-purpose. It's not just uh, doing one thing. So you can do multiple foods with that. And we started our company in 1992 as a specialty kitchen equipment trading company. And then in 2008, we pivoted and then we started Coco Town. And then we started, uh, you know, Coco Town with the continuing the our idea and our company culture, which is sustainability is a big deal for us. We want to do the sustainability in cocoa farming, customers, businesses, and environment. Even before sustainability became the inward, we were, you know, actually doing it. And our pillars are equipment, education, and exposure. So we just, like I said, we don't just give the equipment. Though the equipment, we know they are all patented machines with high return on uh, investment. And that works for more than a decade. And then education is, uh, we used to have been to bar workshop for people to know about the theory and practical about uh, how to make chocolate. So it's not just a, a TV show. You will be actively participating it, learning it. So, and then in uh, 2020, we pivoted to the Empowering Chocopreneur webinars. And thanks to people like Claudia who are willing to learn, you know, share their knowledge with the community. So we make, make it accessible, free and open to anybody in the chocolate community or chocoholics. We don't restrict to our customers. And then exposure, this one is limited to our customers. We uh, help them to exhibit at chocolate festivals for subsidizing their you know, booth cost. And then we have enabled and accelerated the bean to bar craft making chocolate uh, because we, these machines are low initial investment and minimal footprint and they use uh, minimum uh, energy to operate. So it's also cheaper to maintain and operate and also you need only the basic skills to use these machines. It doesn't have to be uh, very complicated. And then now the farmers can uh, add more value for their beans by selling as semi-processed or fully processed products. Like they can sell it as a nibs or coverture or a chocolate or whatever they can, uh, their business plan and their circumstance calls for. And then we also have <clears throat> equitable pricing. So we have the price transparency, all our prices are on the website. And regardless where you are, you will have the same pricing and consistent pricing structure. And we also offer financial assistance. If you need it, the machines and you need any financial assistance, please feel free to reach out to us. And then the product development, like we said, we always uh, come up with the new machines. We have a strong R&D. We have innovative machines. And we also have continuous improvements based on our customer interactions. And when we do the improvements, it's not just like uh, iPhone that when the new model comes, you have to sell the old model at a cheaper price or just throw it and then get a new one. But ours is, you can, it's backward compatible. That means the new improvements, you just buy those improved parts and use it in the old machine to bring it to the current technology and current performance. And we also have capacity building. We have the machines to match your journey, budget, and your business plan. You can make chocolate anywhere from half a kilo per batch to 90 kilos per batch. So we can also help you build mini factories and that impacts uh, has a major impact on local economies. 
And then this is a small timeline. Uh, we started in 1992, but it took two years for us to decide what we are going to be selling in our parent company. And then in 2006, we started selling melanges. And then 2007, we started selling commercial uh, grinders for the you know, chartered making. And then in 2009, we registered Cocotown. And then we started doing all the other machines. We started with the melanger, but now we have the complete line of machines. And then we have the patterns like you see here. And then uh, we, in 2020, well, we started the Empowering Chaco Produce webinars during the pandemic. People were, you know, uh, tied up at home and they didn't know what to do. They couldn't even go to their farm in some countries. So we wanted to show them the hope and at least they can use their time at home uh, learning something new in the industry. And also now we have the tempering machine and we are also coming up with some more new machines and accessories. So we are constantly improving. So we just want to uh, finish our uh, thing, our Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu that uh, translates into may all beings everywhere in the universe be happy and free and may the thoughts, words and actions of my own life connect in some way to contribute in some way to their happiness and freedom for all. So thank you for attending this webinar because without you, this is not useful. So now Teresa is going to take over. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Balu. Okay, I just want to do a tiny bit of housekeeping. Uh, I'll make it very short because we want to get on to the presentation. I have a feeling it's going to be packed with lots of uh, helpful information. This session is being recorded, so you will, don't worry about taking notes. You will get a link to view the recording. We will send it via email, and what we would really love is with that recording, your link, you're going to get a, a link also to complete a survey. We'll take just a few minutes to complete that survey. It really helps us to be reminded that we're on the right track. It also will help shape the um, coming webinars so that uh, we know what type of topics you would like us to cover. So uh, if you'll complete that survey, it'd be really helpful. So again, um, you'll get a recording. The other thing I wanted to tell you is please put your questions in the chat. Even though we're gonna have a Q&A time, if you put them in the chat, it's really helpful. You won't have to remember your question till the end. We may um, have a little space for questions during the presentation, but I think most of the conversation or questions will be at the end. But as you think of them, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat as we may be able to jump in and ask Claudia the question during the presentation. Okay, well with that, we'll just take a quick moment to get to know Claudia a little better and learn about her cocoa, cacao, chocolate journey. And maybe Claudia, you could tell us a little bit about where that journey started for you. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, when I think of the moment that my journey started, it's it's must have been, uh, I, I guess about, uh, or a little bit less than 30 years ago. I remember when I was in 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 when I was about ten years old. Um, we had to give in front of the class uh, with 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 some of my uh, my other uh, with some of the other kids of in school. We had to give a talk about chocolates, and I remember that we went to the house of one of these kids to prepare our talk and that we bought some products in the supermarket uh, so that that the other kids could also taste the chocolates. Um, and um, I, I was, I totally forgot this experience. But uh, then, when I started working in in in, in cocoa and chocolates um, in two thousand and eight, uh, after some time, all of a sudden, I realized, oh, but many years ago, I did already something on chocolate. So probably it's it's some some meant to be, or uh, I don't know. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. We appreciate that. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you, and we look forward to it, and we thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now I will start sharing my presentation. If all goes well, you can see it now? Yes, we got gotcha. you. Yes, perfect. Okay, um, so today I'm going to talk about complex chocolate creations. I will explain later on what that is, but 
I guess many of you are making your own chocolate from bean to bar, eh? but with that chocolate, you can also make other uh, kinds of chocolate products. Um, the only thing is when you do so, you have to consider the shelf life of these products. Eh? And, and today I want to learn you how you can boost the shelf life of this type of products. Okay. So let's have a look at the world map. Um, as you might be well aware of, eh? so here we have the equator. And in the region, uh, about 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south of the equator, there is the cacao belt, so where, where lots of cocoa trees are growing. Now, where is Belgium uh, on the world map? Here it is. It's a very, very, very small country in Europe, um, far away from the cacao belt. So we have no cocoa trees at all in Belgium, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, we have a totally different climate, so it's unsuitable for growth of the cocoa tree. Now, Cacao Lab is located in Belgium. Here you can see a picture of our building. And uh, Cacao Lab is actually an, a company, a spin-off company of Ghent University. It means that originally Cacao Lab was part of the university in Ghent. But later on, it transformed into a standalone company. And it was Professor Koen de Wetting, he's a Belgian chocolate professor, that founded the company in 2012. Now, the slogan of our company is innovation and training from bean to praline. Innovation, indicating that we do a lot of R&D work for, for third parties. These can be companies within the cocoa and chocolate industry, but these can uh, as well be ingredient manufacturers, for instance, or uh, machine manufacturers. Training is also a very important part of our activities. Um, we offer different kinds of trainings. I will give a bit more explanation later on. And from bean to praline is indicating that we know uh, and we do have uh, devices, technologies to make chocolate from bean to bar, huh? but we also use that chocolate to further process into all kinds of chocolate applications. And praline, that's one of them. Praline, you might not know this name, but the praline is uh, the product uh, that we refer to here in Belgium um, that has a chocolate shell and that has a soft center. Huh? If you ever have the chance to visit Belgium and you go to Bruges or to Ghent or to Brussels, you will find many of these small chocolate shops in the city centers where they sell these type of products, so the pralines. Now, with Cacao Lab, uh, we offer, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, uh, R&D services, so you can consider us as an external R&D partner. So we do a lot of bilateral contract work. That means that we do projects for one specific customer. Uh, um, and depending on the request of the customer, we can do some research work, we can develop new products, we can offer consulting services. Um, and here in this slide, you can see a list of topics that we are often working on. Uh, of course, bean to bar is an important one, but also reformulating chocolate products. Uh, for instance, how to um, decrease the sugar content in chocolate products. Uh, stability and quality, that's what I'm going to talk about today. That is also very important. We do a lot of projects on this matter. Uh, we work, of course, also on sustainability, but rather on, on making processes more sustainable. Uh, and that leads also to innovative processing. The training part, um, yeah, we started uh, organizing seminars already in the very beginning, but now we have a more extended training program. More on that in the next slide. And open innovation is also very important to us. Uh, so Cacao Lab is basically uh, taking the initiative to bring partners from the entire cocoa and chocolate sector together to brainstorm on new ideas, um, to see where we can co-create um, and where we can join forces to, uh, to work towards innovation within the chocolate sector. Here you can see the different training formats we have. So we have an annual training program of uh, recurring uh, courses uh, uh, for uh, various uh, people, uh, ranging from bean to bar makers, 
uh, craft bean to bar makers to to people working in the large companies in R and D departments or quality departments. Uh, so we we have courses that are suitable for people with no scientific background. We have also very scientific courses that are then more suitable for people with a scientific background. So we offer a whole range of trainings. Um, besides that, we are also very uh, famous for our workshop, Cocoa and Chocolate Processing. Um, we have been organizing this workshop since 2012. Uh, in the meantime, we had uh, over 20, uh, participants from over 20 countries uh, worldwide. Uh, a lot of them coming from cocoa producing countries and they, they then come to Belgium for an intensive workshop uh, where, we, where we dive deep into everything behind cocoa and chocolate processing. And they also have the chance to make their own chocolate from bean to bar in these workshops. This year will be new, but we will also organize such a workshop normally in uh, Ecuador and in Malaysia this year. Uh, the focus will be slightly different, um, but we, have, we are working together with local partners to organize such a workshop in the cocoa producing countries. Then from next week onwards, we will also uh, offer on-demand online courses. So the first one that we will uh, make available is uh, focusing on bean to bar. Uh, so more information uh, will be released next week. And then, of course, we also have one-off events. Uh, we, we sometimes have seminars in Kakalab where we focus on one particular topic that is um, that is very relevant at that moment, or we organize an online webinar, uh, uh, also focusing on particular topics. If you want to find out more about our training activities, you can go to the website, uh, www.kakaolab.be slash training, and there you can find a nice overview of our training activities. Maybe an important one to mention um, is our free webinar of next Tuesday on chocolate making from bean to bar. So. I would like to invite all of you to join this webinar. It's for free. You can also uh, get access to the replay uh, afterwards if you are not available at that time. Uh, but uh, yeah, would, I would love to see some of you back in this webinar. So very welcome to join. Okay, so this was a brief introduction to our company Cacao Lab in Belgium. Uh, but of course, you're uh, very eager to learn more about complex chocolate products. So today I will first explain what these products are. Secondly, I will uh, tell you a bit about how these products are made. Uh, there are different ways to make them. Then, of course, the main part of my presentation will cover the shelf life of these complex chocolate products and how to boost the shelf life. And uh, I would also like to say something about challenges for storage of such products in tropical conditions, because it is more challenging to store these products, but in under tropical conditions, it is even more challenging. So let's start with the first one. What are complex chocolate products? So I have a question for you. I can imagine that, that most of you have no clue what I mean with complex chocolate products. Uh, but I would like to, to set up a poll anyway to, to see a bit uh, what if and, and what, of, what kind of products you are already making at the moment. So there is a poll. Um, how can you join? There are two ways. Either if you have your smartphone available, you can go to menti.com. Uh, so it's a very short uh, URL. It's very easy to insert. So you go to menti.com and you use the code that is mentioned on this slide here. You can also scan the QR code on this slide with your mobile phone. So I will give you some time to do so. Uh, uh, don't worry, take your time, please. Um, for those who don't have uh, access to their mobile phone right now because they are following this webinar uh, via their mobile phone, you can also uh, add some uh, of these uh, products in the chat. Now, uh, to explain what, I don't want to completely explain it in the slide, but when I, when I say complex chocolate products, I'm not referring to the to a chocolate bar, to a plain chocolate bar. Um, so I'm referring to any other type of product where chocolate is combined with something else. It can be anything. So I will give you, let's say, uh, 
about two minutes uh, to complete uh, this, and then we can go uh, to the um, to the results to see what uh, what you noted there. I can imagine that some of you only make chocolate bars. Nothing else is added, or nothing else is being brought into contact with this chocolate. You can then simply answer no. Uh, then we also know that it is not applicable to you. Huh? It doesn't mean that you're not producing it now, that it cannot be interesting to produce these products in the future. So let's figure it out. Okay, so I will wait a little bit. I will give you, let's see, perhaps one more minute. I hope that is okay. Um, so for those who didn't hurt, uh, you can go to menti.com and use the code 1818-2524. There you can insert the type of complex chocolate products you or in your company uh, are being produced. Um, if you don't have a, a smartphone available to do this, you can also use the chat um, in this Zoom meeting to uh, add the name of, of some of these products. Okay, in the meantime, I will sh stop sharing my screen. Okay, stop share. I will have a quick look if I can already see some results. Okay. I am I see that some people already replied. I will give you a little bit more time. Yes, very nice. Okay, I will share my other screen. There you go. Look at this. I see many different names. The ones that are the largest are the, the most popular ones. So I see truffles, chocolate bark. I see pralines, bonbons. Basically, that's the same thing. Pralines, it's a name that we often use in Belgium. Bonbons is a name that they use in the Netherlands, but it's the same product. I also see chocolate bonbons, nut pralines, milk added to bars, caramel inclusion bars, confectionery, chocolate bonbons, flavored drink mixes, flavored chocolate bars, chocolate with pepper, crystallized ginger, chocolate and inclusions, Chocolate cream mix, um, ganaches, bonbon, nuts, nuts covered with chocolate, dark chocolate with almond. I see that you get the point. So I see many, many nice examples. Thank you for that. Okay, now I will move back to my PowerPoint presentation and share that one with you. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Complex chocolate products. What are these? You can see a few examples in the pictures here. If we want to cat categorize them, we could say on the one hand, we have filled chocolates. And these can be the so-called pralines, uh, but can also be filled chocolate bars. They, they, they contain a soft center usually. We can also discover chocolate-coated products like cookies, wafers, cereal bars, granola bars, ice cream sticks that are covered with a layer of chocolate. And we can also, uh, or we ha also have the category chocolate bars or tablets with inclusions. Um, and these inclusions can then be whole or part of nuts dried fruits, crispies, and so on. So these are basically all the type of complex chocolate products that I will be talking about today. Now, because I live in Belgium and I'm working for a Belgian company, we have done a lot of research in the past uh, 15 years, let's say, on filled chocolates, and more particularly on pralines. 
So you will see in the next slides that sometimes I'm only referring to prolines, but it is important to remember that the principles that I will explain for prolines are also valid in the case of the other complex chocolate products. Okay, that brings me then to the production of complex chocolate products. Let me first explain how prolines are made. So, there are different ways of making these products. And the first one is traditional molding. Yeah? Uh, we use polycarbonate mold molds for this. You can see uh, such a mold in the picture. Yeah? So we usually first preheat the mold a little bit. Yeah? Then we um, insert tempered chocolate into the mold. Uh, we vibrate the mold uh, to remove air bubbles and to avoid having um, air inclusions or yeah, cavities in the chocolate afterwards. Uh, and then uh, we cool down the, well, we, we remove the excess of chocolates uh, and then we uh, cool the uh, chocolate shell. So that's the first step in which we create the chocolate shell. You can see the result at the left bottom picture. Um, there you see the, the um, the mold with uh, different chocolate shells inside. The next step is depositing of the filling into these uh, cavities. Um, then the filling is usually cooled uh, because they also often contain fat that needs to crystallize first. Um, and then afterwards we add uh, chocolate, uh, we add the chocolate base. Uh, so we add more tempered chocolate on top. We scrape off the chocolate. Um, the excess of chocolate, we cool down the product uh, uh, a bit further and then afterwards we can demold the products. How can you recognize this type of products? Um, if you if you go to a shop and you see this, you see many chocolate products, if they always have, if they are identical in shape, if they always have exactly the same shape, then they must have been produced with a mold. Now, if you, an, another way of making pralines is in robing. Here you can recognize these products. Uh, uh, usually they are, uh, uh, they have a rectangular shape or a square shape, but they are always a little bit different in shape. So not 100% exactly. They look very similar, but they are always look a little bit different in shape. Now, how do we make these type of products? First, we prepare the filling and we pour the filling into, yeah, it's something, a kind of metal thing um, uh, that that allows uh, uh, or that can be put in the fridge and uh, to allow the filling to crystallize. And once the filling is hard enough, we can cut the filling uh, with a special tool. Um, and then afterwards, we put the filling on a on a conveyor belt and uh, and th they pass under a chocolate curtain. So under they, this is an enrobing line. And so but the, the fillings uh, are passing under a chocolate curtain and are, are as such covered with chocolate. Afterwards, we cool down the product further. Uh, very often we add a little bit of decoration on the on the proline first, and then we allow the product to cool further. So this is an example of an enrobed product. Then besides that, if we look at, at industrial scale, um, at the industrial production of filled chocolates, uh, of pralines, um, there are also other techniques that can be applied. And one of them is frozen cone. Uh, and that one is depicted here in this image. Um, so what is, happen what, what is happening? You have a, you have a, a, a mold again uh, uh, in which this shell is deposited. And then a cold stamp is pressed. I have to say a very cold stamp. It's it's really, really cold. It's pressed into the mold and each cavity of the mold. Um, and then the chocolate shell is uh, crystallizing very quickly and retains its shape after the, the cold stamp has been removed. In the next step, again, a filling is applied. Uh, the, the base, uh, the so the back of with chocolate is taking place. And then we have the turnover of the mold and the molds, uh, the chocolates are then released from the molds. Another technique that can be used is called stamping. That's a bit different, but in that case, you don't you don't need a mold. So then you just press the cold stamp in chocolates. Um, and then a layer of chocolate is formed um, on the bottom part of the, of the mold. And that is then deposited on the uh, conveyor belt. So that's another way. 
And a final one I would like to mention is one shot. And so during one shot, the chocolate and the filling are deposited into a mold at exactly the same time. What is very crucial in this process is that the viscosity of the chocolate and the filling are uh, very close to each other. Uh, otherwise, you get um, uh, products that are not looking very nice. Uh, uh, but that's another way of making filled chocolates. And in the industry, it's a technique that is, in the meantime, used very frequently. So uh, here you can see how pralines are made. I would also um, like to mention how other complex chocolate products can be made. And there are many ways. I cannot uh, give all the details that would bring me way too far today. Uh, but basically, the main processes can be... Um, can be classified into molding processes, enrobing processes, and dipping processes. So in molding processes, uh, you can see in the left picture, you can see some chocolate tablets. They all have exactly the same shape. So uh, the people that made this have used a mold uh, uh, to make these products. But in, instead of having um, everything filled with chocolate and nothing else, uh, there is a filling applied. So here you can see an example of filled chocolate bars that are uh, made by uh, a molding process. Besides that, you can also here apply an enrobing, uh, an enrobing step. So meaning that you create some kind of center, can be anything, can be a cereal bar, can be a cookie, can be a wafer, can be a granola bar, uh, plenty of options you have. You can have even different layers of filling. So you can have a, a somewhat harder filling, you can have a, a softer filling on top, and then again, a harder filling. So there are, endless possibilities of, of uh, creating the centers. And then finally, uh, these products can be enrobed, uh, uh, coated with a layer of chocolate. And a final uh, process is dipping. Uh, a typical example is uh, ice cream sticks that are being dipped in chocolate. So they, they are allowed to, yeah, they are moved into the chocolates uh, and then um, removed again. And because the ice cream is so cold, uh, a layer of chocolate crystallizes immediately uh, around it and you obtain uh, these type of products, as you can see in the right image. So this is everything about the production. Uh, I don't want to go further into detail, but I think that gives already a very good view on how these products are being made. Okay, that brings me then to, well, perhaps, um, before going into the shelf life, uh, uh, I would ask if there are already some questions at the moment. There will be more time for questions later on, but if you have already some questions related to production, it's time now to ask these questions. Anyone? Yeah, yes. Claudia, there is one question. Um, and and if it's covered in the future of the presentation, we'll, we'll... So the question is, we have salted almond chocolate bars. Currently, we add salt directly to the chocolate before molding. However, we feel this increases the risk of bloom. Is there a better way of adding salt flavor to chocolate? Yes, I will talk about bloom later on in the presentation. So indeed, I agree it would be best to come back to this question uh, uh, after we had this part on fat bloom. Okay? Very good. Yes. Okay, then I will... Um, yeah, most of my presentation will then deal with the shelf life and how to boost the shelf life of complex chocolate products. Now, before uh, talking about fat bloom and so on and shelf life of complex chocolate products, I would like to make the comparison with plain chocolates. Now, the question here is, is chocolate everlasting? If we look at plain chocolate, we could state that it is very long lasting, but it is not everlasting. Um, in plain chocolates, uh, the, the most common uh, quality issue is fat bloom. Eh? And fat bloom is usually the result of uh, storage for a too long time and at too high temperatures. Um, so fat bloom is characterized initially by a loss of gloss. So you see that the chocolate bar tends to become less glossy. 
And then after a while, a gray whitish haze is formed on the chocolate. Now, if we look at the chocolate under the microscope, uh, uh, we can see a very, uh, very nice images. Uh, uh, that's then the scientist uh, and me talking here. Uh, but um, if you look at a fresh chocolate, you see a quite even surface, not a lot of irregularities. So uh, that's uh, that's usually a nice looking chocolate. But if you look at a bloomed chocolate, uh, a severely bloomed chocolate, you see these wonderful structures under an electron microscope. Uh, so you see needle-like or needle-shaped structures that are protruding the surface and that, um, yeah, they, the light that, um, that uh, touches the face uh, is, is, um, is diffracted in a different way and that results uh, in the fact that we observe fat bloom as a gray whitish layer on the chocolate product, which is very unappealing. But under the microscope, it is, you could say it's even art. It looks uh, wonderful. Now, um, of course, one condition uh, or yeah, one condition to to avoid fat bloom is to have a uh, well tempered chocolate. So I have to talk about tempering today or about pre-crystallization. Uh, tempering is a kind of pre-crystallization of the chocolates. Now, in in chocolates, uh, the fat, which is cocoa butter, can crystallize into different crystal forms. We also call these forms polymorphic forms. Uh, so cocoa butter is typically characterized by polymorphism. It's a difficult name, but it simply means that the cocoa butter can crystallize into different types of crystals. Now, um, if we look at, at the possible phase transitions uh, from one crystal form into another in cocoa butter, and there is an important article, scientific article from Van Malsen that is explaining that. But uh, I would like to explain that a bit more into detail today. So if you look at the different crystal forms that, uh, that can be present in cocoa butter, it is the beta-5 form, and it's only the beta-5 form that results in the desired properties for the chocolates. And with desired properties, I mean uh, it results in chocolate that contracts very well, so that can be easily demolded from the, from the polycarbonate molds. Uh, it also results in chocolate with a high gloss, in chocolate with a good snap, meaning if you break the chocolate tablets, uh, that you can hear the sound of, of, of the breaking process. Um, and also chocolate that has a, a longer shelf life, meaning that it does not show fat bloom within a couple of days or weeks. So the tricky thing is that if you have your melted cocoa butter or your melted chocolate, you cannot go directly from the liquid cocoa butter into the beta-5 form. Uh, um, and that means if you have melted chocolate and you cool it down at room temperature, for instance, at 20 degrees C, it will not uh, be in the beta-5 form and you will have chocolate with very bad properties. It will not contract. It will be very difficult to release it from the mold. It will not be glossy at all. It will not have a good snap. It will, in the beginning, it will bend more like than breaking. Uh, so uh, you don't was you don't want chocolate with with such properties. Now, what is the trick? It's to first cool down the chocolate and create some unstable crystals. Uh, in practice, it's mainly the alpha and the beta prime form that you have. It's not important to remember the names of those. But basically, by cooling down the chocolate, you, you create some unstable crystals, undesired crystals. But then what you have to do is you reheat the chocolate a little bit. So we increase the temperature with a few degrees. And that results in the transformation of unstable crystals into the desired beta-5 crystals. So that is the purpose of tempering. We have to create the beta-5 form. So no matter how you temper your chocolate, because there are different ways to do so, but no matter how you do it, the end result should always be the beta-5 form. And so that's why we need to temper. And if you temper your chocolate properly, if you if you then cool your chocolate in the next step, 
the, the rest of the crystallization will be based on the on the seeds and uh, on the seed crystals that are formed during tampering. So also the new the, the other crystals that are being formed during cooling will also be in the in the beta five form. So the purpose of tampering is to create um, uh, about, let's say, a, a few percentages of, of these beta-5 forms in your chocolate, while your chocolate still looks uh, liquid. But if you then cool down the chocolate, you will have a chocolate with good properties. Yeah. Fat bloom, on the other hand, is associated with the beta-5 form. Well, there are different types of fat bloom. Yeah. Um, I mentioned in the previous slides, fat bloom is usually the result of too long storage at too high temperatures of your plain chocolate. But um, in case you do not temper your chocolates well, and then you have chocolate, you have a lot of unstable crystals. You have then alpha and beta prime crystals in your chocolate. And as they are very unstable, they will also uh, quickly transform into more stable ones. And that will result in fat bloom that occurs already after within a couple of days on your chocolate. Huh? If that is the case, it means you do not uh, have your tempering process under control. Huh? But if you temper your chocolate well and you have the beta 5 form in the end, you have a glossy chocolate uh, uh, with a good snap and so on, um, then your chocolate will always develop fat bloom in the end. Uh, because the beta-5 form is not the most stable crystal form. No, the most stable one is the beta-6 form. So this means that all chocolates will eventually form fat bloom. But if that happens only after one year or two years, it is not a problem. Um, so as long as you temper your chocolate well and you store the products properly at, at temperatures that are not too high, uh, they will develop fat, fat bloom only after a very long time. And then it's not an issue. But it shows that tempering is really crucial in chocolate and also in complex chocolate products. Now, if we look at complex chocolate products, they do have a reduced shelf life compared to plain chocolates. So as soon as you bring your chocolate coating or your chocolate shell into contact with something else, simply because of the fact that you have two different systems that you bring into contact, you reduce your shelf life. Right? Does that mean that you don't have to make such products? No, not at all, because they can be very nice for consumers. They are well appreciated by consumers. But it's something you have to think about when you uh, want to make these products. OK, let's have a closer look at the shelf life of, of, of such products. Huh? When we talk about shelf life, most people refer to the microbiological shelf life. Huh? Uh, so that means uh, you want to avoid the growth of bacteria, of yeasts and molds in your products. Uh, and as long as you can do that, uh, the, then your shelf life is, 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 I mean, your product is still okay. But if you get uh, microbiological spoilage uh, before the end of, of, of the shelf life, uh, then of course it's becoming problematic. Um, but we say, Shelf life is more than microbiological shelf life. You also have something like physical chemical shelf life. What do I mean with that? That is the shelf life, uh, or these are the properties of your chocolate product that can change over time as well. Uh, I'm talking about the melting behavior of your chocolate or of your filling, for instance, hardness, bloom stability, Cracking problems that can occur, collapsing even, that's already extreme, but collapsing of your chocolate product. So these are physical chemical properties that might uh, deteriorate during shelf life. Besides that, as scientists, we also would like to refer to chemical shelf life. And the most relevant uh, parameter in chocolate products is fat oxidation. If you look at plain chocolates, uh, and especially dark chocolate, fat oxidation is not really an issue. But as soon as you use uh, milk fats, uh, for instance, in milk chocolate and in white chocolate, you might have a fat oxidation because milk fat is more prone to oxidation. Uh, so if it's exposed to light, to oxygen, 
it will start oxidating and it will result in an unpleasant flavor. Um, so that is something you want to avoid. And what is, of course, the thing if you add, um, if you use fillings or other kinds of products that contain oils and so on, which are usually, um, yeah, more prone to fat oxidation, they can also have an impact on the shelf life of your product. And then the final one is organoleptic shelf life. And with that, basically, it's related to the three previous ones, eh? because if you have a microbiological spoilage, um, your product will no longer taste great. Eh? If, if, if your melting behavior of the hardness of your product is altered during storage, it will have an impact on the organoleptic uh, properties of your final product. So if, if consumers taste your product, it will also they, they will also experience it in a different way. And also fat oxidation, of course, results in an off flavor, which is undesired. So organoleptic shelf life can be related to these three. Now, what is important to realize, only the first one, so the microbiological shelf life, is important for food safety reasons. And in most countries, in Europe, that's the case, in the US, that's the case, but in many other countries as well, uh, food companies have to assure that the products that they sell to consumers, so the products that they bring into the market, that they are safe for human consumption. So they have to follow certain legislation. They have to prove they, like in Belgium, we have the Federal Agency for the Safety of the Food Chain, and that they go to food companies and see if they uh, comply with all the rules, uh, with all the legislation, uh, and that is for food safety reasons. So as a company, you do not want your consumers to, to become sick when eating your products. So that is the reason why many companies only focus on this one. Uh, while the other three uh, are mainly uh, considered for economic reasons and for a consumer as acceptance. Uh, because as a company, you also don't want that, that your uh, products uh, that are getting close to the end of their shelf life, that they are uh, starting to taste uh, very bad, uh, because then your consumers will no longer like this product and will say, next time I won't buy it anymore. So that is the reason why companies are also looking as, at these properties and they want to ensure that also these properties remain uh, or that, that their products uh, uh, still have a good quality at the end of shelf life. All right, so... In the next part, I would like to make a distinction between different types of fillings. Uh, now I'm mainly focusing on pralines or filled chocolate bars or um, any product where you use a kind of filling in combination with the chocolate. And there are different types. So you have fat continuous fillings on the one hand, you have water continuous fillings. I will also briefly say something about uh, alcohol-based fillings. Um, but depending on the type of filling that you bring in contact with your chocolate problems, uh, with your chocolate product, you can have different quality issues. So let's start with the fat continuous fillings. Fat continuous fillings uh, are what we call dispersions of solid particles in a continuous fat phase. If we look at the, at the microstructure of chocolate, they are also dispersion of solid particles in a continuous fat phase. The only difference here is that um, you have not only cocoa and sugar and milk powder particles, but you can also have nut particles, for instance, or other type of particles in a fat continuous filling. And the continuous fat phase is usually um, in chocolate that is then cocoa butter, perhaps milk fat or some other fats can be used. While in fillings, um, plenty of fats and oils can be used uh, so and will be present in the continuous fat phase. So, so but why is this important? If we look at the shelf life of these products, there is no issue with microbiological shelf life. Why is that? Because the water activity of these products is below 0.6, uh, yeah, below 0.60. Yeah. 
Um, I will explain the concept of water activity later on in products where it is relevant, where this parameter is very relevant. But um, in, in fat continuous fillings and also in chocolate, I want to broaden into chocolate, the water activity is so low that microorganisms such as bacteria, yeasts and molds, and even osmophilic yeasts and xerophilic molds that's, that can grow under more severe circumstances, they have no chance to grow in these kinds of products. So it is not an issue, this microbiological shelf life. Now, the physical chemical shelf life is a very important one to consider. So the, the properties like melting behavior, hardness, bloom stability, and cracking can um, can change or can be relevant in these type of products. If we look at bloom stability, the bloom in these type of products is mainly the result of oil migration. I will explain that further in the next slides. That's an important one to come back to. And then, of course, uh, in, in a fat continuous filling, uh, in a fat continuous filling, we have um, different fats, different oils that can be present. Uh, they might uh, have different, um, yeah, they, 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 I mean, they might have different degrees of fat oxidation, but if they do oxidate, then they might result in unwanted flavors. So these three, physical, chemical, chemical, and as a consequence, also organoleptic shelf life are very relevant in fat continuous fillings. And uh, I already referred bloom to bloom, bloom stability, oil migration, uh, Fat bloom in filled chocolate, it is uh, still today a very huge quality problem in many chocolate companies. This is, in this slide, I show the results of a questionnaire that we did amongst 21 Belgian companies back in 2009. I know it's 15 years ago, but I'm sure if we would repeat this questionnaire uh, right now, uh, this, the results would still be very similar. So what did we observe? And when we asked the companies the question, how often do you have problems with fat bloom in filled chocolate products? Uh, only 4.8 says never, but usually these were companies that sold their products um, within a couple of weeks to the consumers. Uh, but most of the companies answered from sometimes too frequently. And so, uh, almost 95% uh, answered be, uh, sometimes too frequently. Fat bloom was mainly reported for milk or dark chocolate with nut-based fillings. And so these were the products that were most prone to fat bloom. And that is quite logic, of course, because it's not that fat bloom cannot occur on white chocolate products, but you simply don't see it uh, because uh, of the color of the chocolate. Now, what is the mechanism of fat bloom? And I would like to tell you a bit more on that so that you better understand how fat bloom in complex chocolate products is formed. Because if you understand that, you can work towards way to avoid this uh, phenomenon. Now, the first condition is that we have or, or the, yeah, we, we observe oil migration in these products. Uh, for instance, from the filling, but it can also be from the nuts or the biscuits. Uh, so oil migration from the filling, nuts or biscuits to the chocolate shell. Um, so that is also the reason why we call this type of fat bloom migration induced fat bloom. Now, um, the driving force, so the reason why we have oil migration is because there is a difference in the fat composition between the chocolate and the filling. And everything wants to uh, go to an equilibrium. Everything in nature wants to achieve equilibrium. And that's also the case for this chocolate and this filling that you bring together, that you bring into contact with each other. Uh, so you have a, a certain fat composition in your chocolate, you have a certain fat composition in your filling, they are different. And the only uh, way to achieve an equilibrium is by migrating um, migrating oil. And uh, so oil will migrate um, from the filling uh, to the chocolate, but there will also be some oil and fat migration from the chocolate to the filling. So it goes into two directions, but um, most of the migration takes place from the filling to the chocolate shell. 
So that's the first step. You need oil migration. And these products, um, or the oil migration is the reason why you have a reduced shelf life. Uh, well, while you will observe fat bloom much faster in this type of products than in plain chocolates. What happens next is that part of the cocoa butter crystals that are present in the chocolate coating will dissolve into the oil. And if you have more oil migration, you will have more dissolution of these cocoa butter crystals. And as a result, again, more oil migration and even more dissolution. So it's, it's a kind of loop that is uh, continuously working. Now, to explain this, um, don't worry if you don't understand the next graph, it's not that important, uh, but I do know that there are some scientists uh, attending today as well. So I wanted to include it nevertheless, uh, but I will try to explain what you see here. In this graph, you see, this is a typical example of an isosolid diagram. Now, let me explain. What do we see on the x-axis? We see temperature eh, from 0 to 35 degrees C. Let's have a look at, for instance, 20 degrees C. Then on the y-axis, we see the cocoa butter uh, percentage, eh? so uh, varying from 0 to 100. Uh, in case you have... Um, yeah, let's let's assume that you have 40% uh, cocoa butter. That means that the rest is oil. Uh, so it's a mixture of cocoa butter with oil. Um, now, if we look at 20 degrees C and we look at 100% cocoa butter, uh, so that's the top part of the graph and that's where the 20 degree line is indicated, then we see that uh, that's that we reach a solid fat content in the cocoa butter of 70. And, and, and yeah, in the cocoa butter, we reach a solid fat content of 70. This means at room temperature, cocoa butter contains 70% solid fat and the rest of the fat is liquid. We don't see that. If you see cocoa butter at 20 degrees C, it simply looks completely solid, but it's, it's in practice, it is a fat crystal network in which part of the liquid fat is entrapped. So we don't see that. It looks like it looks entirely solid, but if we measure the solid fat content, it is 70%. That's, a, that's depending on the composition of the cocoa butter, but in this example, it's 70%. Now, imagine that we add 25% hazelnut oil to this cocoa butter. If we would calculate the resulting solid fat content. Uh, so if we apply the theory, it means that we would have a solid fat content of 52.5%. Yeah, uh, Because oil, hazelnut oil, is entirely liquid at room temperature. So there is no solid fat in the hazelnut oil if we mix 75% of cocoa butter with 25% of hazelnut oil. Uh, in theory, we would get a solid fat content of 52.5%. And that would mean that we only have dilution of the cocoa butter crystals into the liquid hazelnut oil. But what we see in practice is that the solid fat content is about 53%, which is lower than the theoretically calculated value. And that means that a part of the cocoa butter crystals is dissolved in the hazelnut oil. Why did I choose hazelnut oil? Uh, it's, a, it's a very common oil being present, of course, in hazelnut. So if you make um, a hazelnut-based filling, uh, then, of course, you have plenty of hazelnut oil uh, present in that filling. And if that oil migrates to the chocolate shell, it will dissolve part of the cocoa butter crystal. So if you don't understand this graph, just remember oil is migrating and that oil dissolves part of the fat crystals. Then the next step that we need in order to get visual, visible fat bloom is recrystallization of the cocoa butter crystals. I already talked about different crystal forms or polymorphic forms. Um, well, I mentioned already that beta-5 is not the most stable form, crystal form in cocoa butter. It is the beta-6 form that is the most stable one. And what we do see is that Oils like hazelnut oil or almond oils, oils, they accelerate this beta-5 to beta-6 transition. 
Yeah. And you already know that this beta-6 is associated with the formation of fat bloom, yeah? but just the presence of beta-6 alone is not sufficient. What we need uh, is uh, we need crystal growth. So these beta-6 crystals should grow sufficiently. Yeah? And this is uh, caused by um, a phenomenon that is called Ostwald ripening. That means that smaller crystals disappear at the expense of the larger crystals. So the smaller crystals disappear, the larger fat crystals only grow further and further and further. And if you have sufficient growth of your fat bloom crystals, only then it will result in visual fat bloom. So initially we observe a loss of gloss on the chocolate product, but if, you, um, if the beta-6 crystals grow further and further at a certain point, the fat bloom crystals will become visible for the human eye. And uh, as nice as it is under the microscope, it is very unattractive for the consumer if the chocolate product looks like the one on the right side on top. Okay, so that is how the mechanism of fat bloom formation in filled chocolate works. So if you have now a soft filling center or you have a cookie or you have Another product that is in contact with the chocolate, this is something that can take place. Now, um, a couple of years ago, I, uh, I wrote a, a scientific review on fat bloom and especially on the importance of microstructure. If you want to go into detail, do not hesitate to contact me. I can share the publication with you. Um, I would like to summarize uh, the, the, the main parts in that review article in this slide. Uh, so we already know fat bloom is the result of oil migration. Uh, so the oil can migrate through the chocolate shell. Um, what is a very important concept there is tortuosity. Uh, um, it basically determines the length of the part of, of a certain uh, oil molecule through uh, through the chocolate shell. Eh? So it depends on where it has to pass, how long it will take. Eh? And the longer the spot is, the, the better, and the, the more it will, the more time it will take for the molecule to migrate to the chocolate surface. Uh, so if you want to avoid fat bloom, it's it's any method that helps to increase this tortuosity will also delay fat bloom formation normally. We do know uh, from literature and from our own experience that this oil migration is largely influenced by the microstructure of the product. Uh, so we can play with microstructure. For instance, we can play with certain processing parameters to uh, impact the microstructure and that might in return have an impact on the fat bloom. Structure density is an important principle here too. Mainly, or basically, what we what we want to say here is that the more dense the chocolate shell is, uh, the more resistant it will be to fat bloom formation. To give one example, if you have non-tempered or badly tempered chocolate, you have a more loose structure. You have more cavities within your chocolate structure, and that will lead to faster oil migration or more oil migration and faster fat bloom development. If you temper your chocolate properly, it will have a very nice, densely packed structure, and that will, uh, in return, retard oil migration and fat bloom development. I can talk about hours on this topic. I have been studying uh, fat bloom in filled chocolates uh, at Ghent University since 2008. I have uh, worked at the university for five years. As a scientific researcher, I worked on a European project and a Flemish project uh, on this particular topic. Uh, when I started working in Cacao Lab in 2013, um, well, even nowadays, we often have projects focusing on how to uh, delay or avoid fat bloom development in chocolate products. So I can say that I have in the meantime, uh, over 15 years experience on this topic. So I, I could talk for hours on this, uh, but today I want to explain the basics for you. Now, what is in a very important theory that you should remember when talking about fat bloom, but that is also relevant to other uh, quality issues later on, but it's the principle of the hurdle or it's the hurdle theory. 
What is the idea behind it? Is that you should build sufficient hurdles to make sure that you your product does not develop fat bloom too fast. Um, you can imagine, uh, you, you can visually imagine that, that if somebody has to take several hurdles, uh, it, it delays the time. Uh, if, they, if there are no hurdles, they can run very fast, but if they have to jump over these hurdles, it delays the time that they need to get from point A to point B. Now, with Fat Bloom, it is the same. Uh, the more hurdles we can build in the process uh, by playing with the formulation, the uh, the more difficult it will be for the product to develop fat bloom. And if you do not have sufficient hurdles or you do not have sufficient high hurdles, you will have fat bloom very fast. So now what, if I can say some, if I can give you some general recommendations, how to avoid fat bloom in your products, I would say start with proper processing conditions. And especially, have a closer look at your tempering protocol and your cooling protocol. If one of these or both of them are not optimal, the risk of getting fat bloom will increase. So first make sure that for a, a given formulation of the chocolate product that, you're, that you have uh, optimal conditions during tempering and optimal conditions during cooling. Unfortunately, I cannot give general recommendations there because it depends or it can vary from product to product. Depending on the recipe of your product, you might have to adapt your tempering protocol and your cooling protocol. Now, if these uh, processes are under control, then of course, proper storage conditions are crucial because you can have a very glossy product that shows no fat bloom at all after your production process, but if you if you, if you're if in your storage uh, room uh, in the warehouse or or during transportation or even in the shops the products are stored at too high temperatures they will develop fat bloom very fast so you might have had the perfect products after production but if they are not stored properly it uh, yeah it will turn out to be uh, developing fat bloom very fast. Now, if you have optimized your tempering and your cooling protocol and also your storage conditions are acceptable, but you still see fat bloom very fast, that means that there is no other solution than reformulating your product. So meaning you have to play with the formulation with your recipe um, to make your products um, less prone to fat bloom formation. So you can select appropriate ingredients. Uh, you can add anti-blooming agents, for instance. There are different ways. There are, yeah. And uh, I, I did not include all the solutions here because there is simply not enough time to go into details. Uh, but there are different ways um, to reformulate your product and to make the products uh, uh, less sensitive towards fat bloom. I picked one example. Uh, uh, at Ghent University, we did some research on the storage uh, of chocolate products at uh, in the fridge, so at 4 degrees C, uh, and in a freezer at minus 18 degrees C. So we stored some chocolate products for several months uh, under these temperatures. And what we observed, uh, that's uh, an article from Friedrich de Pepre, who is now working at Barry Calaboats. But we observed that, um, that this had a beneficial impact on both oil migration and fat bloom development. So they, so they were both retarded by applying such a, uh, a post-processing treatment. Um, the, there were some indications that uh, such a treatment had a uh, crystallization effect or an effect on crystallization and uh, that it led to permanent microstructural changes. So we can even say that by applying these treatments, uh, there was some evidence that we could even improve the quality of the chocolate products, which is completely different for other type of food products, because normally if you freeze a food product and you thaw it afterwards, the quality is, de is, is, is deteriorating compared to a fresh product, and you have to mention on your packaging that the product has been frozen and has been thawed. Yeah? 
In the case of chocolate, the situation is a bit different. And that was very surprising, but we do know from uh, several companies that they have been applying this um, post-process treatment to improve the quality of their chocolate products. So this is one that I definitely wanted to mention. Huh? There are more ways to retard fat bloom, but generally, if you want to prevent fat bloom, it is important to uh, keep this uh, loop of microstructure, oil migration, and fat bloom in mind. Huh? So if you can improve the microstructure of your chocolate or of your filling, and that results in less oil migration, it means that you will have less fat bloom in the end. Huh? So that is, um, so I, I gave the example of proper tempering, for instance, but there are many more. If you use different ingredients, you can also alter the microstructure of your chocolate and filling. There is an exam an, an exemption, uh, yeah, one exemption though. Um, if you're using anti bloom fats, what we have seen in our research is that uh, then in that case, you do need oil migration because anti bloom fats are, can be, if they are being applied in filling, they should migrate to the chocolate shell. Um, and because they can uh, prevent the beta-5 to beta-6 transition. Uh, so uh, in that case, you need oil migration, but um, yeah, you do not have this beta-5 to beta-6 transformation, and that also results in, in, in a delayed fat bloom formation. Okay. So this was the part on fat continuous fillings. Before proceeding, I would like to ask again if there are some questions, because if you have some questions related to fat continuous products, I would like to answer them now before proceeding. Any question? There are no, a few I see questions. Somebody has a... Sorry, go ahead, Mrs. Butler. No, no, go ahead. I didn't see you though. Okay. Can you read the questions? Sure. So Sharon asks, how long do you need to wait for plain chocolate to cool for the crystallization to be complete? And can you wrap chocolate before this process is complete? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Um, what you need to know about crystallization is that it is a dynamic process. So if we start from our melted chocolates uh, and then we cool down the chocolate, we temper the chocolates. As soon as the first uh, crystals are being formed, the crystallization is started. And it's it's it does not stop within a couple of minutes or within a couple of hours. No, the, the crystallization process can take very long. Even during shelf life, the product can um, further crystallize and uh, and still sh show some changes. So for a plain chocolate, um, it depends, of course, on the, the type of mold that you're using and the size of your chocolate products. Um, you can imagine if you have a very thin chocolate tablet or uh, like, a, yeah, like a square of chocolate, a very small one, or you have a chocolate tablet, which is really huge and quite thick. In the, in, 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 in the case of this thick chocolate product, you need uh, to, to cool longer, uh, to have sufficient cooling. Um, usually in, in, our, in, in cacao lab, we apply cooling uh, times between, let's say, half an hour and one hour. Um, that is usually sufficient uh, to 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 have sufficient crystallization uh, um, but if you have very thin products sometimes even like 15 20 minutes can be sufficient um but why why do i think this is a very good question uh, even if you stop the cooling process the crystallization does not stop so it's true that you have you need sufficient crystallization um before wrapping uh, and before packing, uh, before stacking chocolate products on top of each other. Um, but just realize that even then you will always have some post crystallization. Uh, uh, in the first days and weeks after production, your chocolate can, can further crystallize a bit, although uh, the majority of the crystallization, of course, should have taken place during the cooling process. 
if you are if you have the possibility to let's say if you wrap the chocolates individually but you can still leave them well if you can avoid stacking them immediately on top of each other that can also be helpful uh, we of course in our lab it's easier right? because we don't uh, produce huge quantities of chocolate products but if we have the chance we allow our chocolate products to rest for like 24 hours before we ship uh, the products to any of our customers. And because we, we usually see that if we ship them too fast, it will result in problems. Um, it might result in, in a faster fat bloom development. Uh, but we, we often have the chance then to leave the products next to each other and not stack them on each other. Because if, if you put too many chocolate products on top of each other or next to each other, that are still in the in 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 their crystallizing phase. Um, crystallization means they will release heat. Uh, uh, that is that is always happening. If you have crystallization, heat is released. Crystallization heat is released, and if that heat cannot uh, go into the surrounding air, but just goes into the 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 product that is next to it, then it can result again in local melting of the chocolate, which you do not want. So. Let's say if you if you work with polycarbonate molds or other types of molds and you see that um, the chocolates contracted well, so that there is no detachment anymore between your chocolate and your mold, you had good detach uh, yeah good detachments. Um, I would if you can leave the products a little bit longer, uh, let's say on trays or uh, for a couple of hours extra, it's always beneficial. But sometimes practically it's it's not uh, it's not feasible, and then then it's important to have a very good cooling process to make sure that the majority of your crystallization took place before you start wrapping and packing the chocolates. Okay, very good. Thank you. I want to just um, pop back up the list here to uh, Rohan's question about um, their almond bars in which they're adding salt bef uh, before molding and they feel that this increases the risk of bloom and they're wondering is there a better way of adding salt flavor to chocolate to reduce that risk may i ask in, in what sh in, in what form is this uh salt added is it is it like in powder is it in crystals or in is it in uh i as far as i know i of course, uh, almonds, almonds contain almond oil, and as such, the product is um, more susceptible to fat bloom formation compared to a plain chocolate. That's clear from, from the slides that I showed before as well. But as far as I know, I haven't seen any scientific study so far that studied the effect of addition of salt on fat bloom formation. We haven't studied that ourselves and I haven't uh, seen any study like that. So I would be surprised uh, on the one hand um, if that would be the case uh, to test that we would need to uh, to make some products without salt and with salt and compare them in an uh, accelerated shelf life test uh, to see if there is actually an impact, but I have not seen it so far. So um, and he, they did respond that table salt yeah, uh, is well, what they're using. I, I do know that salt is often used in chocolate products to enhance the flavor of the chocolate product. Huh? Um, so it's not, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's very nice to use salt in your chocolate product, but I haven't, I haven't seen anything on the effect, on the impact on fat bloom formation. Very interesting question. I should look it up. <laughs> Any other question? There are other questions. Let's see. Do you want to do the second, continuous uh, questions I, or do you want to go on and, and do the questions yeah. at the end? Maybe There's one some... more and then we can proceed to the next uh, slide. Hold on. Mrs. Balu is interjecting. Okay. Because see, these are all related to the tempering. She wants to talk about the water continuous fillings. So let's complete her presentation. Then we will go back to the question. And for the okay. people who are putting in the chat, Let's say if we run out of time, then we will you know, get the answers from Claudia and we'll send us an email. So don't worry that it, if it's not answered today because we are only half an hour and she has a lot of information. So I want to finish her flow and you know, the, yes. all the points okay. we should learn first. 
So please bear with me and then Claudia, please continue. Very good. Okay, I will do so. Can you still see the presentation? Yes, yes we yes. see this presentation. Okay. okay, so I would also talk about water continuous fillings today um, because they, they behave differently and this has an impact on the shelf life of this product. Huh? So water continuous fillings, what do I mean with that? These are, yeah, water continuous systems can be solutions, dispersions, emotions. It does not really matter how we call them, but examples of such fillings are, for instance, ganaches. And so ganaches are fillings made of chocolate, cream, perhaps butter. Uh, also caramel fillings are examples of water continuous fillings, fruit-based fillings, fondant and sugar-based fillings. So these are all examples of such products. Now, there, of course, we have the risk of microbiological growth. Huh? These fillings have a water activity that is higher than 0.6, so it's higher than the threshold for microbiological growth. And we can have a uh, growth of bacteria, yeasts, and molds. And at lower uh, water activities, we can also have growth of osmophilic yeast and xerophilic molds, uh, which uh, usually grow under more uh, severe conditions. Also, physical chemical shelf life is an issue in these type of products. Um, it also, bloom can occur here, but this is usually then the result of moisture migration. I will come back to that later. Um, and of course, also fat oxidation is possible because it's not because it's a water continuous filling that it can not contain fat or oils. So, so this can also be present, result in fat oxidation. And of course, organoleptic shelf life is also relevant here. Now, before going further, uh, I would say I would like to say something about emulsions. Uh, um, I'm sure you all know emulsions. That you, you might uh, uh, face emulsions probably every day, whether it's in food applications or cosmetic applications. Uh, but there are different types of emulsions that exist. So on the one hand, we have oil and water emulsions. Uh, so they are uh, schematically um, depicted here. You can see an oil and water emulsion. In that case, you have oil droplets in a continuous water phase. Um, and on the other hand, you can also have water and oil, oil emulsions. In that case, you have water droplets in a continuous oil phase. So it's a very uh, simple, simplified scheme, but it helps really to understand the difference. Now, examples of such an oil and water emulsion are ganaches, and caramel fillings. Also whipped cream, which can be used as an ingredient. Uh, but uh, so these are examples of an oil and water emulsion. Whereas while water and oil emulsions are rather butters and margarines. And these can also be ingredients that are being used in fillings or other products that will be brought into contact with chocolate. Now, um, what is the, the challenge here is, um, depending on, on, on whether you have an oil and water emulsion or a water and oil emulsion, you need a dispersing agent or an emulsifying agent. Um, so as you might know, in chocolate, for instance, soy lecithin is, is commonly used, uh, uh, but you also have other types of emulsifiers and um, an emulsifier is characterized. Uh, so if you look at the molecule, you have on the one hand a hydrophilic head, uh, which is here now represented as a blue head, polar head. And you have also a lipophilic tail, which is here the yellow tail that you can see. And depending on the type of emulsion, um, your uh, molecules will be directed or will be oriented in a different way within the food product. Um, so in case of an oil and water emulsion like ganaches and caramels, you have your hydrophilic heads that are oriented towards the uh, outsides, uh, uh, towards the water, basically. And the lipophilic tails are oriented uh, towards the oil droplets. Um, and that's this, these type of um, molecules, these type of products are very important to make a stable emulsion. So if you talk about shelf life of ganache products, of caramels, um, uh, it might be very important to consider the type of emulsifier that you are using. Now, I already mentioned that ganaches uh, are made from chocolate. 
and cream. Uh, and if we mix them, uh, we obtain an oil and water emulsion, and which is then called, uh, in this case, a ganache. Um, there are also different ways of making ganaches. Uh, uh, this is one method. Um, what we see in the chocolate, we have sugar, we have cocoa mass, we have cocoa butter, we have an emulsifier, the soy lecithin, and usually uh, natural vanilla is also present. In the hot cream, we have, uh, so we have the cream as such. Sometimes a stabilizer, for instance, garagenin is used, and that's not always the case. And that results then in the ganache in oil droplets um, existing of cocoa butter and or milk fats in a continuous water phase. These are very complex structures uh, from a scientific point of view, extremely interesting to investigate. Uh, uh, but I wanted to, to give a bit more explanation on, on, on some practical uh, things that are important when you work with these kinds of products. Now, to give you an idea of how the way you make the ganache has an impact on the structure and, uh, and the properties of the ganache, I'm showing uh, some uh, images in the next slide. Now, if we look at the maximum droplet size of a ganache that is made in a Stefan mixer, uh, uh, we see here, uh, you can clearly see that this is an oil and water emulsion. So the oil droplets are clearly visible in this uh, microscope image. And in between the oil droplets, you have your water continuous phase in which also the sugar uh, is dissolved. Now you can see that these oil droplets have a size, an average size of about five micrometer, uh, which is not, um, not very high. That's good for the stability. Now we did a comparison. Uh, one of our master students in the past did a, a comparison between the, the microstructure of a ganache uh, made with a Stefan mixer on the left side. So that's a high shear mixer or uh, uh, made with a mechanical ultra turex stirrer. Eh? Uh, so which has a lower uh, rotational speed. And we could see that uh, if you use this type of mixer, eh? the fat droplets or the oil droplets that are present in the ganache are much, much larger. And this has an impact on the product properties, on the hardness, for instance, of the ganache, but also the stability of the emulsion. Now, luckily, we could see uh, that um, by adding uh, lecithin, in this case, uh, we could improve uh, the droplet size in the ganache. So, what you have to remind of the slide is uh, that uh, the processing conditions have an impact on the structure of your ganache, but that also uh, the, the composition of your ganache can uh, have an impact on the shelf life, on the stability of your emotion and the shelf life. Now, one very important parameter when talking about water continuous products is water activity. So there are different intrinsic factors uh, that are important. It's water activity on the one hand, it's pH, but also for instance, use of antimicrobial agents uh, can, can are intrinsic factors that can be relevant in, in ganache or water continuous products in general. But today I only want to focus on water activity. Uh, uh, water activity is a measure for the amount of free water in a product, in a sample. Uh, so if this value is too high, uh, so it's normally, and normally it has a value between zero and one. So if it's below 0.6, as I mentioned before, there is not really a problem, then it means that there is not sufficient free water available for microorganisms to grow in the product. But if the water activity is above 0.6, then and especially if it's uh, reaching values of 0.8, 0.9, then really it becomes problematic. And then microorganisms, they like this kind of environment and they, they will grow and grow and grow. Now, in this table, you can see um, what the minimum water activity is for microorganisms to grow. So as I already mentioned, below 0.6, there is no growth. Uh, from 0.8 onwards, um, Typical molds and yeasts and bacteria uh, can, can grow uh, uh, very easily. At lower water activities, you can have growth of osmophilic yeast and xerophilic molds. Uh, so these, even if you have a water activity between 0.6, for instance, and 
75 or 0.8, um, you can still have microbiological growth. This is important to realize. Now, how can you reduce the water activity of your filling? Eh? There are different ways. They all have an impact, of course, also on the on the texture, on the on the taste, and so on. So it's also you have to yeah to evaluate uh, everything as a whole. Eh? But one way, or probably the best way to re to reduce the water activity, is by removing water. Eh? If you work with a, a mixer that has a vacuum pump. Uh, it can help to remove water uh, by applying a vacuum. Or one way is also to add less cream. Of course, you need to find a good balance between still having a good texture and reducing your water activity to a sufficient level to avoid uh, microbiological growth. Uh, a, a, very, a very good way to reduce water activity is also by adding sugar or salt. Uh, in this case, um, uh, salt has also water binding uh, capacity, uh, so that, that also has an impact. So basically also the higher the sugar content of your product, the lower the water activity will be. Now, there are also some uh, uh, other components such as glycerol or sorbitol that can uh, have a water activity lowering effect. Huh? Uh, glycerol has a stronger effect than sorbitol has, uh, uh, but both are commonly used to reduce water activity in ganaches or caramels or similar products. Uh, the use of invert sugar can also be a way to, to, yeah, to reduce the water activity uh, uh, and at the same time then enhancing the stability. Okay, so... This is very brief about water continuous fillings. Um, there is much more to tell, but um, yeah, I think these are important concepts that you need to understand when you work with water continuous fillings. Then this brings me to alcohol-based fillings. I do not want to skip that because I want to make my story complete, but I do know that these fillings are at least in Belgium, much less popular. So I do not want to spend too much time talking about this. Uh, but what I mean with these type of products is um, uh, fillings, liquid centers that have a very high alcohol content. I'm referring to, for instance, the Mon Chéri product. Some of you might know it. Uh, so they usually have a liquid center. So if you bite the chocolate, it's really a liquid filling. So you have to make sure that, that you don't... Um, spill it uh but uh yeah and they taste very much uh like alcohol and so uh these type of products um there is also no issue with microbiological uh issues even if you have a water activity above 0 0.6 0 0.6 because there is so much alcohol growth of microorganisms is is not uh taking place uh. But physical chemical properties and organoleptic properties might uh, might be problematic in these type of products. So you can have cracking of your product. You can have collab collapsing even of your product. Um, migration of your ethanol from the center to the chocolate shell. Uh, so there are quite a lot of issues. But it's it's a product that is pretty special. And also the way it's being made. There should be a sugar uh, layer between the chocolate shell and the and the filling uh to yeah to to make to to keep it stable for quite some time uh so this is a more challenging product i don't want to go further into detail but yeah just to make the story complete i wanted to add it okay and then a few more slides on the challenges for storage in tropical conditions uh, we have been talking a lot about fat bloom in the previous slides, but if we look at tropical conditions um, where you usually have not only high temperatures, but also a very high relative humidity, sugar bloom might also be an issue. So if we look at filled chocolates, uh, um, we can see here some images of a chocolate shell taken with an electron microscope by one of our former PhD students or one of the PhD students of Ghent University. So we see on the left side a fresh chocolate, but after some time we see that moisture is migrating to the surface of the chocolate. 
So this is not necessarily the consequence of um, of a high relative humidity, but this is this was also a chocolate with a water based filling. So uh, we can have migration of the moisture from the filling. Uh, what happens then? Either you have migration of moisture from the filling to the chocolate shell, or you have moisture, uh, a too high moisture content, a too high relative humidity in the environment. In both cases, the moisture. Uh, that comes in contact with the sugar particles, so which are hydrophilic. This uh, this moisture will be absorbed um, and will result in swelling of the particles, um, and it might result in cracking of the chocolates and an accelerated moisture migration. So you can have products that look really really bad. So. Um, in the next images, you can see even sugar bloom crystals uh, appearing on the surface of the filled chocolates. So you can see these very irregular structures. They are the result of sugar bloom. So what is sugar bloom? It is different than fat bloom. We see it also as a gray whitish appearance of the chocolate surface, but it has a different mechanism behind. So what is happening? Uh, so the water is absorbed on the surface. Uh, the sugar crystals that are being present in the chocolate, they are dissolved in the water. And if the water is then evaporated again afterwards, then the sugar crystals will recrystallize into very, uh, yeah, so you have a kind of wild crystallization of your sugar crystals and you have very irregular structures at the chocolate surface, uh, resulting in sugar bloom. So this is something absolutely important to consider when you store your products in tropical conditions. Um, how, how can you avoid this? Well, first thing to, to understand is the, the impact of the relative humidity. And to give you an, an idea of what the impact can be, we are using here the Mollier diagram. How do you have to read this? Well, I will give two examples and then it will become clearer. Um, we have, um, for instance, if we look at an environment where we have a temperature of 30 degrees C and a relative humidity of 70 degrees C, so it's already more tropical conditions, then, uh, so you read that, uh, on the, on the y-axis you see 30 degrees C, uh, on the x-axis on top you see 70% 70, uh, 70 relative humidity. So if you follow the lines in the diagram, you can see the intersection. And then if we go down, we can read uh, on the on the other line, we can read what the dew point is under those conditions. Huh? And the dew point is 24.5 degrees C. That means if, if uh, your chocolate product, for instance, has a temperature below 24.5 degrees C, there is a risk of condensation on the surface of your chocolates. Yeah? And risk of condensation means that you will get sugar bloom. So that is pretty challenging in tropical conditions. If we look at more, a more European climate, for instance, where the temperature is 20 degrees C and the relative humidity is 40%, then we are at a different location in the diagram. So if you look at the intersection and we draw a line to the bottom, we see that the dew point is only five degrees C. So that means if you have your chocolate, you store your chocolate products, for instance, at 15 degrees C and you bring it then into an environment that's 20 degrees C, 40% relative humidity, that there will be no risk of condensation. So the risk on sugar bloom will be much, much reduced. Um, it does indicate that, imagine that you store your chocolate products in a fridge at which is at three degrees C, I'm just giving an example. And then you put your chocolates in an environment which is at 20 degrees C uh, and relative humidity 40%, then you will have also risk of condensation. Uh. So uh, I often get the question, should I store my chocolate products in the fridge? I usually say no. Uh, you have a pretty high risk of, of formation of sugar bloom, not only here in Europe, but especially in tropical conditions. Um, yeah, you see that the difference in temperature between the environment and then the, the dew point um, is, is much lower in tropical conditions, so indicating that you have a much higher risk of sugar bloom formation. Okay. 
So that brings me then to uh, to the last slide with some take home messages. Uh, what is important to remember from my talk today? Well, first of all, plain chocolate is long lasting, not everlasting, but long lasting, whereas complex chocolate products uh, have a reduced shelf life. Um, if we talk about shelf life, it's more than just the microbiological stability. Uh, uh, we have seen also physical chemical stability and so on. Then problems that are reported in filled chocolates uh, depends on the type of filling in the first place. So if you have a fat continuous filling or a water continuous filling or an alcohol based filling, you might have different quality issues in such products. And it is important to realize with which type of product you're working in order to better understand how the uh, a certain problem is caused and what could then be a good solution for such a problem. Besides that, the problems reported in such chocolates uh, also depend on the composition, on the processing and the storage conditions. I think the previous slides were pretty clear on that. Um, these all have to be optimal in order to uh, reduce the number of problems. And then finally, the hurdle theory, I explained that theory in, uh, when I was talking about fat bloom in uh, fat-based fillings, but it can also be applied to water continuous fillings and to chocolate in general. Uh, so this theory states that it is important to build sufficient hurdles in order to increase or boost the shelf life of your product. Okay, so that was uh, that was then the last slide. Here I have another slide with my contact details. Uh, you see the address of Cacao Lab in Belgium. You can see our website. I also uh, separately mentioned the link to our training activities. Um, so if you're interested in our training activities, you can go to cacaolab.be slash training. Uh, you can also contact us on events at kakalab.be if you have further questions related to uh, our training activities. And I would also like to mention that we are on LinkedIn. You can follow us on, on LinkedIn under the name Cacao Lab. We are on Instagram since January. Um, so you can follow us there uh, under the name Cacao Lab underscore Belgium. And we're also on Facebook under the name Cacao Lab Belgium. So if you uh, are on this social media, we would love to connect. So uh, yeah, and it would be great if you follow us to get more uh, information on the topic that I discussed today. Okay, time for questions then, I would say. 